Episode 15, The Epic of Gilgamesh. At the heart of this epic poem lies a narrative that echoes across millennia, a tale of a catastrophic flood sent by the gods to cleanse the earth of humanity's sin. Sound familiar? Well, it should because it's a story that bears a striking resemblance to the biblical account of Noah and the Great Flood. But before we draw parallels and dive into the depths of this ancient narrative, let us set the scene. The Epic of Gilgamesh is one of the oldest surviving works of literature originating in ancient Samaria around 2100 BC. It follows the adventures of Gilgamesh, a legendary king of the city of Uruk, and his companion Enkidu, as they embark on a quest for immortality. The fucking Epic of Gilgamesh. Bad fucking ass. You know, <clears throat> I've been, uh, obviously you know that I've been reading that uh, the book, the Anunnaki Collection, and it talks a little bit of... Um, of uh, the book or uh, of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and it also talks about how how just like c connected everything kind of is, and what my I'm not done with the book, and I, I wanted to start the Buried Book too, um, that talks about the the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh. But I was like, you know what, like let me play out this podcast and then see what you know, mm -hmm. what maybe I learn more, and then we can obviously continue because the epic gilgamesh is going to be talked out throughout throughout mm -hmm. ex extensively throughout the podcast and yes what i came to my conclusion is that i don't know what it is but i'm pretty sure you know but it, it seems like everything has uh the same i don't know just I, we're gonna keep fucking repeating it but everything has the same story the same like narrative but in different narratives like different names but it seems to be like this repeats itself yes um part of it in the anunnaki you know connection part of the so the explanation for an ancient astronaut theorist which we covered what that is if you don't know what an ancient astronaut theorist is it's basically they believe that aliens or some gods or a collection of or a pantheon of gods um, fucked around with the human genome and and is the reason why everybody's history is connected and with through through that as you say the connection um after the great flood after the flood of noah or just after the catastrophic global flood that affected everybody um there the pantheon the anunnaki pantheon evolved in every single civilization that survives passing down the knowledge and this is this is the this is a general which that topic in itself will be covered at a later podcast for now we're just going to focus on the epic of gilgamesh i'm just referencing something as to what could it possibly be that's connected and in this world you know it's unfortunately it's a lot of interesting things behind these stories but there's just nothing concrete to of there's nothing there's no concrete evidence but um ultimately in this in this world that is the reason why everybody holds such similar stories like the great flood yeah uh that that's see that's where i see that there's a lot of lack where everyone has speculations but we can't really I mean, we can't really have any evidence to it, too. Mm -hmm. So it's like you got to take it all with a grain of salt and just be like, okay, okay, I, I see you where you could be right. But, you know, is it right? <laughs> yeah. Or is it rubbish? Now, f for you guys that don't know what the Epic of Gilgamesh is... The Epic of Gilgamesh is an ancient Mesopotamian epic poem considered one of the earliest surviving works of literature and it originates in ancient Samaria and is written on clay tablets in cuneiform script. The epic revolves around the legendary king Gilgamesh of Uruk and his adventures. Key themes of the epic include quest for immortality, friendships, and the nature of humanity. 
Gilgamesh is depicted as a powerful but tyrannical ruler at the beginning of the story. His exploits and friendship with Enkidu, a wild man created by the gods, led him on a series of adventures including battles with monsters and a journey to seek immortality. Ultimately, Gilgamesh learns the importance of accepting mortality and the value of leaving a lasting legacy through deeds and relationships. The Epic of Gilgamesh provides insight into ancient Mesopotamian cultures, beliefs, and the human condition. It has influenced literature and mythology throughout history. If you guys, um, I referred to the Sumerian podcast that we did, Cuneiform. Uh, the Sumerian tablets and Cuneiform is the oldest surviving records of human history, the earliest surviving records of human history in the form of of for example i'm gonna reference it in the form of a book it's something that was that that records history of some point and maybe that's why the epic of gilgamesh so for, first of all the reason the epic of gilgamesh survived is because it was hidden in a in a temple and it survived through multiple wars through multiple things and then it, it, it was it was hidden for such a long time nobody took importance until it was discovered and probably why it resonates so much with everybody is because of the probably biggest question, you know, life and what happens after life. And not only that, but not only that, but, you know, we're finite human beings. And this Gilgamesh is a... Uh, we'll, we'll dive into what the Epic of Gilgamesh is in a summary, but Gilgamesh is a demigod. He's part human and part uh, god. And part of it is, you know, he's scared of, of of his mortal life. And I think that's just something that hits close to humanity, and maybe that's why it's uh, a great piece of literature. But you can't just look at it as a great piece of literature because it has religious meanings behind it such as and we'll depict this in tablet 11 or tablet 10 can't remember um it has the first story of the ancient flood the oldest story of the ancient flood so people think of an ancient flood and they think of noah and the flood nah mate think of gilgamesh actually in particular think of the epic of atrahasis um which we'll dive a little bit more into that later but the epic of gilgamesh has one has the Epic of Gilgamesh and the Epic of Atrahasis has the oldest depiction of the biblical flood, which if you look at this text through a different lens, you start to kind of see that it's not just a piece of literature. It could possibly be historic uh, in the way of that Gilgamesh was most likely a real person. It's his real historical events or a hyperbole of events that happened around a real person and uh, archaeological, we know that there was an enormous flood at some time, possibly at the end of the Younger Dryas, which was uh, at the end of that, you know, the last Ice Age that we had. But what do you think of that, though? Like, you know, but this, this is the this is a curious thing, though, that, you know, we are diving into the realm of of pseudoscience. It's not, you know, what we're going to talk about, like my brother said, Take it with a grain of salt, but just understand that there could very well be a different picture to the story. I don't know. It's kind of just hard to to understand the time. That I'm gonna go back to my timeline thing, but it's kind of hard to understand the timeline thing because it's like, if this is the oldest one, you know, wouldn't that push back Noah's, you know, Noah's flood way more than what actual timeline I guess would be. And then, then, then you like, then you like, you kind of just get mixed up and then you're like, where, <laughs> you yeah. know, um, so it's just like, this is older than supposedly when, isn't this older when, than supposedly when Noah's Ark happened or Noah's flood happened? Yes. Right. Yes. So, so first of all, and, and again, this is. And I kind of wanted to avoid this because we do have we intellects has plans to do um, uh, some sort of a podcast about the flood collection of all the collections around the flood. Oh, okay. But 
we find that this, the earliest surviving tablets that this is was 1800 BC, um, which is 4,000 years old. Now keep in mind, the, the Epic of Gilgamesh is 4,000 years old. Keep in mind that the tablet 11 or tablet 10 where the flood is, where the great flood is depicted in the Epic of Gilgamesh, it is actually believed that it's, it's, it's taken from a different epic, the Epic of Atrahasis, which is still Sumerian. Um, that dates to 1650s BC or 3600 years old, the Epic of Atrahasis. And it's actually believed that the story we know now, the Epic of Gilgamesh, which if you guys want to educate yourself on the Epic of Gilgamesh, I recommend this book by the great Andrew George. Um, this is the revised version master of fucking work it has all the pit all the depictions of the stories the babylonian sumerian and akkadian stories and as well as other poems that 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 are made in the name of gilgamesh which pro which accounts to that he was probably a real person if there's so much information around this person now it's believed that the compilation that we know of today the modern epic of gilgamesh that we're going to go through um, was revised and added and things taken out. And the flood is believed to have been installed at a, at a later date. Now, it's most likely the case that it, that the Epic of Atrahasis was inserted in the Epic of Gilgamesh at a later point. Um, however, it's just still unclear, which is actually one of the reasons what makes the Epic of Gilgamesh so valuable and so interesting is that we have missing parts. We're finding older, different clay text. Still to this day, we're still finding new fragments and pieces of this story. So there's still that mysterious aura revolving the Epic of Gilgamesh. Yeah, uh, in that in that book in that book that I was talking about, uh, sh the the author wrote. She brought up a few uh clay tablets that they were just that they were just discovered i mean that book came was released in 2020 and these tablets were discovered i mean within 10 years mm. i don't know if it has anything to do with epic gilgamesh but it has something to do with discovering new tablets yeah which is again in the sumerian civilization is is, is the motherland when it comes to the the peak evolution of humans where humans took a change um, of course, humans didn't develop everything there in the Sumerian mm -hmm. lands, and we've seen bigger developments all over the world, uh, and particularly uh, Gobekli uh, Tepe. But this is where we can trace back all the all written, at, at least recorded history. So, I think that the fact that we are still finding clay tablets makes the future very right because we get to learn about our past with these new discoveries so in your in your perspective why would someone be interested in the epic of gilgamesh oh for multiple fucking reasons for example if you're religious i would be interested in the epic of gilgamesh because it depicts the one of the oldest versions of the flood mythology so could it be that the flood mythology in the epic of gilgamesh is copied from you know um the bible copied it from the epic <laughs> Stop, of gilgamesh don't, don't say that don't say that <laughs> um because it's older and or or even more interesting which a gentleman on youtube uh his channel is inspiring philosophy has a very interesting point is that if a global flood really does happen it doesn't necessarily mean that for example the mesoamericans have a global flood story it doesn't mean that they copied it from the sumerian tablets or that they copied it from colonizers you know you know the spanish colonizers they were they were catholic they were in the old testament they showed them the ways oh it was just scribed later they just added it later like in the epic of atrahasis but it could a better point is that it's a shared it's a shared culture it's a shared connection it's not a copycat story it's it's that it's something shared. Instead of looking at it, it that the Bible copied it, which I do lean towards, 
that the Bible actually did copy <laughs> this because we know that Abraham is their Abrahamic religions, mm -hmm. uh, uh, religions, and you know where Abraham's from, the city of Ur yep. in the Sumerians, you know, in the Sumerian yep. cities. Yep. So it's very likely. However, it's very important to note that although that's my belief, uh, there's nothing that coincides in literature. Even the oldest text of literature and the oldest text in the Hebrew Bible, it's nothing that coincides in the literature. So it's not a copycat, but it could very well be inspired. Um, now, keep in mind that the, if I'm not mistaken, the oldest, um, the oldest text that we have of the Bible um, is about 500 BC, so 2,500 years ago. And I think that was through the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Epic of Atrahasis and the Epic of Gilgamesh, it's a thousand years earlier. The story was around for a thousand years before the Bible was even written. Now, keep in mind that there is some evidence that Moses and um, the Hebrew people were wandering the wilderness. Uh, there is some accounts that the Egyptians have in hieroglyphs that actually refer to that. Now, that is highly debated and you know, who knows if that's true. If that is, if that, if it's true that Moses was a real person and there was wandering people, um, it would date the verbal or the oral tradition of the Old Testament to around 3,500 years ago when Moses wrote the Pentateuch, which the Pentateuch is the first collection of, you know, the book of Genesis, mm -hmm. uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, traditionally ascribed to Moses that he's, he's the one that, that wrote them and uh which would be the torah as well yeah and that's uh i'm gonna keep bringing that up but like that the that book on anaki connection they talk what i like about it is that it's not just anunnaki like remember when i was telling you when i was bringing other stuff up and you're like what the fuck is talking about this talking about that i'm like mm -hmm. yeah because i think it's particularly of the anunnaki um but it's it's trying to connect one thing to another and that's what she does in the book and um you just i think that's i think that's what in my point of view i think that's why we shouldn't take the bible like a science book or put it in a timeline especially like the old mm -hmm. testament it's because like bro i mean jesus time is for sure jesus time yeah i understand that but like the, the old testament is like do we how do we really know that like there's all these connections with the mayans and the aztecs and all mm -hmm. they all have some sort of like Quetzalcoatl and all that stuff. And when you start getting into it, it's very complicated and it's, you kind of have to invest your time into it. But when you do, you start realizing that, whoa, why do these have the same stories? This has mm -hmm. the same as this. This has the same that this isn't. So, and even back to that, um, that, uh, that Netflix, uh, ancient apocalypse, you know, mm -hmm. fucking Graham Hancock's that gets yeah. a lot of, you know, shit it does get a lot of shit, but in a way he's trying to, he kind of connects, he connects the, some sort of dots. Yeah. And that's why I'm like, whoa, huh? Like that's very interesting to take in consideration also. Which is one of the reasons why Graham Hancock for this genre, for this, let's call it, um, because that's what the archeologists and, you know, the scholars call it pseudoscience, pseudo archeology. Mm -hmm. Let's call this, uh, you know, pseudo some shit. I don't know what to call it, but he gets a lot of shit. But the thing is, dude, this guy, and which is like, like Graham Hancock is like a hero to me because he opened my eyes to a different mm -hmm. picture. And the thing is that archaeology, dude, a lot of it sucks. A lot of it sucks. Um, a lot of it, people didn't, you know, did a half-ass job with it. And actually, Milo Ross. Uh, I think his chant of the Minutemen or something along those lines. He he bashes on his own archaeologist. Like, what the fuck? Oh, are you really? Doing? Yeah, he does the same thing. I think. I, I think, mean, that's good. That's good. Yeah, he also bashes a lot on oh, Graham yeah. Hancock, and I particularly his Netflix series, Ancient Apocalypse. Um, Ancient Apocalypse. Um, so, the beautiful thing about it is that it pushes a conversation that needs to happen. Yeah. The, the the evolution of humans goes far f far back than what archaeologists deem it to be so now and the the question that archaeologists asks 
are the wrong ones, I believe, because they say, okay, you know, Graham Hancock, you say technology. What technology? Well, it's not fucking iPhones. It's a different form of technology, such as, such as uh, Gobekli Tepe. What they had some sort of technology to create such a massive scale of of a complex, and archaeologists think that it's it wasn't it was for ritual purposes because they didn't find no clays or this or that. But I feel that the lack of trying to put yourself in the ancient people's footsteps lacks in the archaeology world and that's because if you were to tell me to build something like gobleki tech uh, Go, what is it gobleki tepe no yeah, yeah I, I don't want to mispronounce it because then my would probably trash me <laughs> no um gobleki tepe is if you were to tell me to build something like that <laughs> good luck bro all right dude when you when you analyze what it is and what it does and how it looks at the stars and mm -mm. so it's like when archaeologists say that that's just uh what did they say just hunter gatherers made that yeah. fuck you go fuck get you fuck you yeah. fuck you the thing about i think in general the thing that surprises me with the ancient civilizations is their knowledge of the fucking sky what the fuck? Like, how do you even come up with these things? How do you track them? How do you... Maybe maybe I'm just, you know, too ignorant in that aspect of astronomy. No, it's just that we weren't made to, like what you said the other day, to just work and live. And we have a deeper meaning in our lives, but this whole concept of life is misunderstood and mistaken for other things. Mm -hmm. We're not here to just work, live and die. We're here to work and we're, we're here to live and understand the meanings of what is to be in this realm in my eyes, yeah. to be in this realm until we go on to be unknown. Yeah. You know? And we don't grasp at, we don't, you know, we don't, I don't know. It's pretty sad if you. I mean, I, I, like, like have we mentioned it before? Like going out and when we once we go backpacking, once we go, you know, the only thing that's calling me to hikes and stuff and backpacking is the sky. Yeah. I'm sorry, and it's not. It's obviously it's the beauty of Earth because you know. I talked to Jackie about it. I was like, dude, if there was another planet, I don't think I would even want to go. I haven't even tasted a little bit of this planet. So why would I want to go somewhere else? Obviously, I would love to see pictures, but it's like. Once you start going out, you're like, dude, look at our planet. It's so be this exists here. <laughs> yeah. So it's just like, you know, it's just like I, but what calls my attention is the sky to just lay there and be like, whoa. And, and the thing with these ancient civilizations, um, is there is in fact that the knowledge of the skies, it shows, it shows, for example, what you mentioned, you know. We don't know, we're not, we're not, you know, we can get educated really quick because, you know, we just live in the modern age and knowledge is at our fingertips, but it, and this is what Graham Hancock talks about, that it, it, the human civilization is pushed back far further than before the ice age, at, at, at least knowledge, because we have this transfer of knowledge that, for example, in, well, let's take the Sumerians into account, that's what, uh, six, you know, six to eight thousand year old civilization when they developed agriculture and stuff like that mm -hmm. to have the freedom to understand all these things. But they pick up already knowing these things, yeah. which shows that most likely agriculture, which which equals to leisure time, probably happened far further. The thing is that there's just no evidence for it, um, which I think the Mesoamerican uh, communities are attributed to the oldest uh, corn kernel uh, or modified, you know, trying to like harvest corn in large scales. They are, I think. Um, which that dates to 10,000 years ago. That's, that's at the end of the, that's at the end of the, of the younger driest ice age. But you, you see, you see where you just kind of ticked me off right there. Not you obviously, you me off, but like where you just kind of like, you you just said that we don't have any evidence for it, but do we really have any evidence for, for uh, you know Noah's Ark? You know, do we have any evidence for 
you know, the Garden of Eden? Do we have any evidence for, you know, first first of all... So, so you get you get what I'm trying to say, though? Like, yeah. we don't have evidence for that, but we have so much faith into that, which I am not, you know, I am not saying anything wrong. I'm just asking a question where, you know, how do we believe that, but we don't... We can't open up our, at least mine, or to see why this even exists. Yeah, um, and actually, uh, as I just mentioned earlier, I think that the Noah's Ark is inspired by the Epic of Atrahasis or the Epic of Gilgamesh, and then later rewritten to fit the Jews' narrative or the Hebrew people's narrative. Um, in fact, uh, the Garden of Eden is also inspired by on by uh anunnaki text it's in the numa elish it's where the anunnaki created beings to they modified beings um in fact the first being that they created was adamu from in the in the sumerian clay tablets and i think everything i think that's inspired and you see that in you see those correlations in the bible so evidence do we have evidence for that um, I think, I think we have it in the form of different texts, such as the, the Sumerian tablets, I think. And, and I, like I said, I, I think that although the Bible is such is the most historically ancient book and sci and it's, it's science, it's scientifically backed. The Bible is scientifically backed. So you can't deny that the Bible is the most powerful book, um, humanity or a God inspired, whatever you want to refer to it is. It's, it's just the most incredible book ever. Nevertheless, um, you know, it's, I, it's, it doesn't originate out of nowhere. And if we take, you know, if we take off a religious cap, I think it's just an inspired book of the greatest minds of their time that created that. So evidence for the, you know, those ancient th things, mm, not really. You know, that's just where I'm like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, but I will say this. There is over 200 flood myths, over 200 flood myths. And out of all of those over 200, you want to know what's the only one that is um, scientifically the dimensions of the ark that survived the flood, you know what the only one is that could survive a cataclysmic flood like that? No, I don't know. The Bible. The Bible's dimension of the ark is the only ark out of the 200, over 200 flood myths that would survive a cataclysmic event such as a global wide flood. Hmm. The ark's dimensions is, is depicted which... Uh, I actually do have uh, photos that would show that would show the differences between them. And did you know there's actually a an arc, uh, a place here in Tennessee? It's in, I thought it was in Kentucky. Maybe, maybe it is. So, so here we have the arc from the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's a cube, not survivable, by the way. Uh, this this place, which first of all, um. As I said, the Bible was created by the best minds uh, because of the Catholic Church. They, the Catholic Church, you find that they are they they look at trying to understand everything. They think that they understand, you know, what God is, and they look at everything through a scientific lens, trying to prove it. So I, I have no reason to believe that this isn't true. Mm -hmm. their, that their study, that the research that went into this isn't true. So this is. The Epic of Gilgamesh, this is the Ark, Noah's Ark, and then this is a different Akkadian Ark myth uh, of how it would look. <laughs> and again, it's it's the one that survives. And here's actually another one kind of depicting it again. This is Epic of Gilgamesh, an Akkadian, a Persian one over here, a Greek. Out of over 200 flood myths, the, you know, the Bible has gets this, gets this right again. So... Mm. Call it, call it the will of God or call it the greatest minds had a thousand years to evolve this, uh, to evolve this dimensions of the Epic of Gilgamesh. So, you know, you can look at it that, yeah, I mean, 
you know what, let's let's fix this. You know, these uh, these Sumerians got this wrong. Let's fix it so it can be more accurately. You know, two, you know, took a thousand years. So, you know, um, was that was that in Tennessee or Kentucky? Uh, I thought it was I could have swore it was in Kentucky because uh, w- oh, and also obviously I don't want to really get into it, but I think wasn't that um, I don't know if you've seen it. Fucking Bill Nye, the science guy, goes there and tries to... Okay, uh, th- this might be super fucking... It's weird that you brought it up, but... So, lo- long story short, this guy had a... He was like a... Ev- An know, evolutionist? I, I, he might have been. Or a Darwinist, you know? He, yeah, he, he like might have been, and then he, like, had a whole... He built a whole arc and this and that, and then, like, Bill and I went and, like, tried to debate him. I can't remember where I saw this. I saw this somewhere. Maybe but, it was there, but maybe they, maybe it was maybe maybe the Noah's Ark was built for, or I can't remember if he built it, but it was something along those lines. Hmm. I I don't know. I didn't know if you if you knew that. No, I don't. At at that Ark place, uh, they do have a life size Ark in it. Yeah, I think that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. It might be actually where they house everything in too, but I'm not sure. But boss, should we let's fucking get into the fucking epic of Gilgamesh, man? You know, I'm actually having so much fun with our conversation right now, but we have to let the audience know what the fuck the Epic of Gilgamesh is. Good thing chapters exist. Or All right, that. guys, let's dive yourself into storytelling time. So the Epic of Gilgamesh is 11 tablets. Technically, it's 12 tablets, but the 12th one was um, served as an appendix. So technically, there's actually 11 tablets. Um. And they go like this. The tablet one is the coming of Enkidu. Gilgamesh is introduced as the king of Uruk, a powerful but oppressive ruler. The people of Uruk pray to the gods for relief from his tyranny. So the gods create Enkidu, a wild man, to challenge Gilgamesh and distract him from his tyranny. Enkidu lives among the animals until he encounters a temple prostitute, Shema who was sent to civilize him. Side note, in the Epic of Gumesh, it notes that they crack for like seven, like for a week straight. That's what it took to civilize Enkidu. Yeah, that guy's for sure a fucking god. (laughs) So I have god. So, tablets through to five, uh, and I'm just, this is a quick summary. However, I recommend a book by... uh, Yeah, I think you mentioned it already. No, I recommend another book. Oh, no. By Captivating Histories, they tell uh, uh, just like a summarized version of it. Uh, it's short read. I think it's like 90 pages. Um, this one tells the actual depict the actual translation. Okay. Um, tablets through two through five. Enkidu confronts Gilgamesh, and after a fierce battle, Gilgamesh ragdolls Enkidu. However, they become the greatest of friends, and together they embark on adventures, including slaying the monster Humbaba, the guardian of the cedar forest. And the slaying of Humbaba is remarkable because not even the gods dared to conquer this beast. Tablet 6 is Ishtar and the Bowl of Heaven. Uh, And here we see Ishtar, which is a goddess, sees Gilgamesh bathing after the fierce battle with Humbaba and attempts to seduce him. Gilgamesh, being a wise king, knows of Ishtar's past lovers and guns the fuck out of her, basically. He basically tells her that she's a gold-digging hoe and to get the fuck away from him. She gets mad, and for revenge, she asks her father, the mighty Anu, to give her the bull of heaven, a beast even greater than Humbaba, to get revenge against Gilgamesh. She ends up killing 30 people in two swings, and brings famine, plagues, and droughts. However, she is soon stopped. The bull of heaven is soon stopped by Gilgamesh and Enkidu. And after they kill the bull of heaven, they taunt Ishtar, even throwing the body part, the bull's body parts at her. Tablets 7 through 8 is, sadly, the death of Enkidu, Gilgamesh's great friend. The gods punish Enkidu and Gilgamesh for killing Humbaba and the Bull of Heaven and decide one of them must die. Enkidu was chosen, so he falls ill and dies, leaving Gilgamesh devastated and fearful for his own mortality. Next, we have 
Gilgamesh is the wanderings of Gilgamesh. Um, stricken with grief and fear of death, Gilgamesh sets out on a quest for to find eternal life. He travels through dangerous lands, meets Utnapishtim, the Babylonian Noah, who survived a great flood and was granted immortality by the gods. The story continues with Utnapishtim telling Gilgamesh of the deluge. And here we find a similar story of, you know, before, before, the, before the great deluge, people were wicked. Uh, there was so much things happening. And eventually, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was Enki that told Utnapishtim uh, to create an ark and to, you know, put your family in there and to create it and to put animals in the in your ark and to survive this cataclysmic flood. We will dive into this later. But for now, let's continue the story with Utana Pishting tells Gilgamesh about a plant that can grant eternal youth. Gilgamesh finds the plant but loses it to a serpent while bathing. The serpent was attracted to the plant by its sweet smell and ate it. Tablet 11, Immortality Denied Gilgamesh returns to Uruk, realizing that true immortality is unattainable. He accepts the inevitability of his death and focuses on leaving a lasting legacy through his deeds and accomplishments. The epic ends with Gilgamesh reflecting on the grandeur of the walls he built around Uruk, symbolizing the lasting impact of his reign. That is the epic of Gilgamesh. Um, Utan and Peshtim, also known as Atrahasis, also known as Ziasudra, also known as Noah. Oh, that's another thing that that book talks about, that all these people have different names. Uh, or not all these people, but like the, the very different depictions of it. They have all different names. It, or different names but they're it's the same thing yes like uh um, i mean we can go all into it like with the unnaki and all that stuff and i'm like oh dang like oh, this is confusing yeah um again um utana Pishtim is from the epic of gilgamesh he's that you know he's the he's the noah character in the epic of atrahasis atrahasis um was the noah in the Sumerian epic of Zayasudra, which tells of the Great Deluge, I think the Sumerian epic of Zayasudra influenced the epic of Atrahasis. The epic of Atrahasis, if I'm not mistaken, is Akkadian, um, a later, a later civilization of the Sumerians. Mm -hmm. um, and then we have the Hebrew Bible with Noah and the Great Flood. However. Um, I don't know, man. You find these things. Oh, is it a copycat? Oh, is it just inspired? Oh, is it just a different telling of the same event? I find it odd that that it's not a copycat. And well, hold up, it's not a copycat because literature, literature, the literature is evidence that it's not copycatted. But whether it's not inspired by the oldest works, I find it very interesting because. In these stories, they all have similar traits, such as there's a flood going to happen because the gods want to destroy humanity. So the gods tell of one person to be in charge of a task to create an ark, him and his wife and his family. And they also have to load up all the animals into the ark and then they survive the, the flood. And then after they survive the flood, they send out a raven. They send out a dove, such as the Noah's flood. And then they set up um, a worship, you know, uh, sacrifices to God, to thanking him for surviving the deluge, the flood. And all of these have that, that same message. Mm -hmm. And you, you can get into, like, the depths of these messages. Um, for example... Um, after after the flood is over and they sent out a raven first and the raven doesn't come back because uh, ravens, if I'm not mistaken, 
fly longer and higher than doves do. And if they don't come back, it means that they found land to rest. And then the dove um, isn't as durable or isn't or yeah, isn't, isn't as durable as a raven, so it means that land is close by and it comes back um, with a piece of that. It is found that this is a is it, this is normal practice for people that sailed back in the day. It's normal practices. So, but that's another thing that in order we didn't we didn't have sailing back then when this story when this deluge would have happened. The oldest forms of of global sailing come from the Phoenicians who they are going to get a podcast episode of the fucking Phoenicians it comes and they're much earlier than when the story would happen oh um, shit keep in mind keep, <sighs> keep in mind that the let's let's just refer to the epic of Atrahasis you know because it was later put it, there's a possibility that it could have later been put in the epic of Gomesh that is 3600 years old that is the written account. There, it's most likely written account goes far later. We just haven't found anything. But oral traditions, oral traditions, they go back. Same thing, thousands of years. When you have, you know, the the shaman or the, you know, the the person in the community that holds the records of all this, and it's later translated down. That goes back way, way further. Which these well, uh, shaman, well, shamanism is kind of like the technically the oldest type of religion, if you would say, you know, mm -hmm. it's shamanism. So, and the thing, in particularly, the Sumerian epic of Ziusudra, Ziusudra was the last king in the Sumerian kings list, which I can't wait for the Sumerian podcast, the Anunnaki podcast, because it's a kings list. Some depicting some king rulers that lasted thousands of years, others lasted a lot less. Which is that the one that got cracked by Marduk? Uh, Zayasudra? Yeah, yeah. Now I can't, I can't remember. But I think Marduk was uh, what was it, Akkadian or Bar Babylonian or something? And wasn't he took over all the Sumerians? Yeah, something but, like that. No? Something like that. But Zayasudra was the last king before the deluge. And if that king's list is to be accurate, when was the flood? You get me? How, mm -hmm. how, in tr truly, if we try to figure out how old this story is, well, it would have to have became so the survivors of the deluge. Like I said, one of the greatest pieces of evidence or sorry not the grades sorry I, I i take that back one of the possibilities is after the younger dryas you know the younger after the the that ice age all that water melting which rapidly melting by the way that dates back to about ten thousand years ago it's like 15, so no? so what it's like 15 no 15 what the younger dryas the yeah. younger dryas was uh is believed to occur between 13, technically 12,900 years and 11,600 oh, okay. years. Yeah, so yeah, just a little over 10,000 yeah. years. So the survivors of that, you know, 10,000 years ago. So it's very interesting when you try to look at, when you try to date these stories. So like I said, it could very well possibly be that this Flood story, these floods myth are the survivors of the people from the Younger Dryas. Which, if you guys don't know, um, the Younger Dryas is, uh, is an Ice Age period that occurred, um, again, between 12,900 years and 11,600 years. Um, and it was one of the... And there is actually something called the Older Dryas, uh, a mini Ice Age that happened before the Younger Dryas. And one of the most interesting theories that why this occurred is because of an asteroid impact hit the Earth causing a, no, a nuclear winter. So all the debris kept the sun's rays from hitting the Earth causing uh, the world to cool down. And then that started a chain reaction, you know, maybe earthquakes, uh, earthquakes, volcano eruptions, with, which furthermore um, fed to that global nuclear winter and cooling of of the world of their, yeah. yeah yeah see that's what i mean that's what i mean like 
I hate timelines. I'm trying to put them into that perspective because, I mean, if you look at it like that, I feel like even Noah, if Noah did exist and all that stuff, that's way, 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 way older. Yeah, um, there's a few possibilities. Uh, and th this is just me speaking, nothing, no evidence, no nothing. So either, either this story comes from that. It comes from that because remember... Remember what the Sphinx in Egypt is dated to. The mm -hmm. with the erosion, that erosion is at the end of the Younger Dryas, which means that the Great Sphinx was built before the Younger Dryas. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I don't. It doesn't make sense that they would build it during the fucking Ice Age. The fucking world is cold as fuck. And before that, we do we do find that it the that desert was you know tro it was a little bit more tropical. There was a little bit more green to that. So. Civilization could, you know, very well spawn that that creation, that technology could very well spawn, you know, over thirteen thousand years ago, which is so that so keep that in mind. And where was I going at? We I think you were just talking about I oh was talking about Noah's and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so there's it. again, and this is just me speaking about what to date it. So. And then, of course, that happened. The Great Flood happened. So it's either it happened at the end of the Younger Dryas, and that was the global flood. You know, the Earth uh, quickly uh, warmed up, and that was the what caused the global flood. Or the these these flood stories could be more localized. In what what do I mean by they're more localized? That it wasn't a global flood. That the these stories only happen near civilizations that near that are near a body of water and only mm. that only they got flooded and it was a much more local local flood it wasn't globally spanned kind of like a some tsunami or something yeah something like that now there is some evidence that um in particularly like over here in these areas with uh you know the sumerian egyptian where they're at there is some evidence that it did get flooded um and then it receded so that could very possibly be and on another note the flood last i think about seven days um in a bunch of these myths the bible gets that right again the bible says you know it's somewhere around 40 days something like along those lines that the flood last so which would indicate that if this place did get flooded it's about the time that it would take to get flooded and to recede you know if if we had some massive warming with, you know, from the glaciers and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So that, and then that would date the flood to, I'm not sure, maybe 6,000 years ago, something along those lines and take that with a grain of salt. Cause that, that's not, I've seen something like that, that the, these floodings occurred somewhere along the, those lines. Um, but I just don't have that evidence in front of me or that research in front of me. So just take that part with a grain of salt. That would have happened around 6,000 years ago. But that is another uh, likely scenario that where this story could evolve from as well. Dang, there's a lot. So um, back to the, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, is there more that we can... Uh, how do I explain it? I want to talk more about Ang what was his name? Enkidu? Enkidu. Enkidu. Mm -hmm. So you said he was you said he was like a, a a demigod? So Gilgamesh was a demigod. Gilgamesh uh, but, is, is the king of Uruk. But, but what I'm saying is that <clears throat> wasn't he like a caveman? Enkidu? Yeah. Yes, Enkidu. He was basically like a caveman and then so where I'm trying to go by this is that with all these stories and all these explanations, um, I'll pop that up here in a bit, but with all these yeah. stories and all these explanations, um, deciphering is kind of key. Mm -hmm. Deciphering is key. And uh, same thing with how I told you that the Garden of Eden uh, the, Ar the Garden of Eden was supposedly made, and, and then, like, you know, God made it, and then, like, you know, with no humans, and then he put Adam, whatever. But 
you can depict that different ways. You can depict that as okay, what well, what could be a garden? Is that was that already was that agriculture culture land? Mm-hmm. And then you have to you know so it's stuff like that. So then also with Gilgamesh, um, how did he become? How did he become like I guess like a human? Gilgamesh yeah. became so Gilgamesh was a human because um, his uh, his pops was a god and his mother was uh her his mother was actually a demigod so Gilgamesh is technically three quarters god one quarter human no I'm talking so, about Enki oh Enki yeah okay no so Enki was created by the gods think of this like Greek mythology Greek mythology created uh people out of clay. So that's technically mm-hmm. so Enkidu was created out of the earth, out of clay. And he was when he was created, he lived amongst the wild animals. Um this is if you want to pop this up real quick. Yeah. This is a the picture on the right is a depiction of Gilgamesh on the right side and Enkidu on his left side and then the different picture on the left side is Gilgamesh holding a lion which would be representable of Gilgamesh's size. Gilgamesh and Enkidu were were giants. They were giants. And a lot of people think that, oh, look, this is just a scaled uh, scaled down version of a lion. Uh, an- ancient astronaut theorists believe that, no, they were just giants, and that's how small lions were to them, uh, which you find this across all cultures with mythology. This is how big things, including Goliath in the Bible, Goliath would have been this size as well. Mm-hmm. Um so he was a wild man, and then to tame him, you know, to tame him, there was a plot to tame him uh, so he could challenge Gilgamesh to rival Gilgamesh. Uh, they sent Shamat, Shamat the prostitute, the temple prostitute. She civilized him through sexual intercourse. And then Shamat showed, showed Enkidu the ways of the human life, and it was like if he woke up from something. So he was just a wild brute, and after he cracked for a week, Something woke up in him that that made him conscious of civilization. Yeah, see, that's that's what I'm. That's what. So that's what I wanted to bring up because that could have been like a dummy dad version of how he became civilized. If you try to de- decipher it in some sort of way, because um, I don't know how to explain it. Like, <laughs> I don't it. it I don't know. I really don't know how how I want to go about this, but it's just like it's some other form of maybe. Uh, I, yeah, I I'm kind of lost on how I want to say it. I really just want to say that it might have been a different form of. With the I just don't want to sound like I just don't want to say 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 say. say, yeah, say, I, just, say. I just don't want to sound like, but it's kind of some form of like type of kind of engineering it, of engineering him of civilizing him. You get me? Like engineering... Uh, no, like how... Like them having sex, how is that going to civilize you? Okay. You get me? Like that, them, them having sex, how is that going to civilize you? It might have just been like... You kind of get what I'm trying to say? Yeah, you know? so like... So if, if, I, if I'm taking... If I'm understanding you correctly and knowing about the Anunnaki and these yeah. things, uh, the Anunnaki genetically engineered human beings and it gave them... And gave them uh, knowledge, and the uh, the way they obtained this knowledge, the way that the human was born, is we have Anunnaki DNA in us. That's what made us. That's what gave us that spark through genetically engineering. Yeah, and then that's Our, how we kind of knew everything right away. Yeah. So, so okay. So are you me? saying that Enkidu was, if you look at it through a different lens, and particularly the Numa Elish, the you know the way the Anunnaki and all that stuff. That Gilgamesh was actually genetically engineered. It it could be a, another form of looking at it. I'm not oh, saying okay. that's what it was. I'm saying that's yeah. another. That's what I mean by all this, all of these stories and all of these um, can just be looked at differently, and it's up to. And that's kind of what I don't like because you can just take that in consideration, or this, or talking about it this way, they'd be like, "Oh, that shit's stupid." Mm. Whoa. Then, then if that's the case, then everything's fucking stupid. Yeah, <laughs> you know, then yes. me, me being born and just off of you know that, then that's stupid. Yeah, yeah, I I do get you yeah, now, but yeah, Enkidu was a wild man, 
and then he was civilized Cause, through. Because also, doesn't it talk about how he had a bunch of hair? He had a bunch of hair. Yes. And then from what I know of the story that he had a bunch of hair, then he just bathed himself, and then that's when he became civilized. But that might mm. be a different. That, but, that might be a different account of the story. Yeah. And um, because, I, I, cause I didn't, I didn't hear about, I didn't hear about the, 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 the sex part. Oh yeah, they cracked. Yeah, they cracked. And actually, uh, again, and and the later part of the story, I, if I'm not mistaken, when Enkidu knew that he was about to die, I think he ended up cracking again for like another week or something like that. <laughs> yeah. So it's just so so you kind of see how, huh? Yeah. Caveman, and then now being civilized out of nowhere. That's yes. where I'm kind of going. Yes. 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 I I do without I, without having. Without kind of knowing what I want to, how I want to say yeah. it, without sounding fucking retarded, <laughs> which which is okay. We're not we're not experts. Oh, for sure, for we're not sure. experts. So, which but is it's okay. just like I don't know how to say like, oh, this and this. How about this happened? How about that happened? I don't want to say that I believe in this. I just want it to be like this is a different lens we can look at it too. Yeah, correct. But so if we can recap the epic of Gilgamesh and why it's so important, it's important because first of all, it's the oldest great piece of literature that humankind created. The literature in this is uh, is what sparks the literature that comes after that. It's what sparks, you know, the people that studied it. It gave inspiration to storytelling and literature is one. Two, it, again, it's historical. It's agri possibly agri uh, archaeological, uh, in, you know, references. Um, and it's serves as some sort of religious text as well you know it the pantheon of gods that revolve in the story of gilgamesh are anunnaki's later it could be possibly that this text inspired you know the bible um and other religious texts around the world so that's also important but if we take that cap off of religious and historical and stuff like that at its at its most primitive in its most primitive way this story serves us as a brotherhood as relationships as deeds as it tells you to cherish what you have because we're finite we're we're finite creatures we're not mm -hmm. going to live forever finite who we have across each other um Love your neighbor and at the end of the day, be a good human being. Gilgamesh's arc is remarkable. Um, the reason why people called, why the people asked the gods to send Enkidu down is because Gilgamesh was a, was a, he was a dickhead, bro. Before women, before females got married to their partner, Gilgamesh had to crack him first. That was law in, in Uruk. So if somebody was going to get married, before they got married, to con Gilgamesh would consummate the marriage before the actual husband would. And people were fed up with it. So Enkidu was sent down to fight against him, and they, and they fought each other, and they ended up becoming great friends. And then he lost his great friend, and... He's trying to find himself. And, and he, yeah, he went on a journey to try to find himself, and ultimately found out that through good deeds... And leaving a lasting legacy in whatever way you want to translate that. Um, I think that the messages of this story is just in its most primitive way. Mm. It shows, you know, you know, the bonds between a brotherhood and the bond that we have with life and death and, the, you know, the, the, the circle of life and death. And ultimately, the Epic of Gilgamesh is a great story, to say the least. At, at its most primitive, it's such a great story. If if you think that this could have maybe inspired the Great Flood or Noah's Great Flood or whatever, why do you think why do you think that would have been an uh, inspiration to do so? Like, what do you think they would have gained from it? Um. So, and do you think they would have they believed it, or they were just like, you know, what, let me just copy, but in a different, in a more, in a more not crazy sounding way. Yes, so I think something that we need to 
understand is the historical context of the Bible and where it comes from. Again, um, the Bible is just not for the Jews. It's right now. It's it's a global book for everybody to read and for everybody to believe in. But before we have to look at that lens, what was it before? Abraham was Sumerian, and could it be that this new project that he was trying to do, uh, he needed to unite the people? Remember, um, the story that he was trying to tell people, um, a flood that everybody at the time could understand. The flood was, everybody understood it through a certain lens and through changing this narrative from the Bab- you know, from the Babylonian and to try to push his narrative of what God told him to create and stuff like this, this could serve as a unification between two peoples the ancient peoples of that believed in multiple deities and the new peoples that God told them to create, which was one God monotheism. And it could serve that he, or that this story was inspired and was used as a tool to unite people um, between, you know, the ancient Sumerians and, you know, to get rid of the Anunnaki and that old pantheon and Mm -hmm. that old way of thinking and introduce something new. Um, I'm not sure if that answered part of your or, question. Or, uh, or just to maybe be like a conscious of your actions and decisions because if if before the flood people were acting all dumb and this and that and then they could just be wiped off like nothing, then it's most likely that it could happen again if we were to act very primitive in that sense too. In, you know? in in regards to the Bible, um, God said that he would never again cleanse the world like he did then. And if I'm not mistaken, the same thing happened in the Sumerian text again. But yes, it shows that it, it, in, Revel, in the Bible revelations, they're going to come, something different is going to come back. A different kind of destruction is going to come back through fire. We find that the symbology of destroying the world with water is to cleanse it of its sins and the symbology of revelations if i'm if i haven't uh read it recently yeah, yeah, yeah. uh is through fire which is destruction the eradication of sin the eradic- the eradication of evil the eradication of anything that is sinister uh which is a different symbology but Ultimately, yes, uh, it's to show you for your actions. You have to remember what kind of world it was back then. There was it was a lawless society. We have the first laws coming up in uh, this with the Sumerians in about six thousand years ago, but there were very primitive laws. They were very simple. You know, uh, if you steal, you have to return it or pay back, or you know, you know, similar things like that. Uh, slave laws as well were were a thing back then, but there wasn't much of it. So all this nomadic things that occurred were could serve as that that they wanted to translate that into this new Abrahamic um, teaching. And then, what what would you say to like people that would kind of not saying call this rubbish, but in a way be like, because I don't know why I've I've like saying that why like humans and how do humans and gods can interact like that how that shouldn't be a thing what what like one of the instances like bringing up jesus you know people saying oh yeah fucking god made his son come down here as a human and they just kill him you can't kill a god you know well it's very curious because First of all, people that say that don't understand what the Holy Trinity is. And um, it's a shame that people look at it through a very primitive yeah, lens. Exactly. That's because, exactly, yeah. because I personally understand what it, you know, yeah. why Jesus exists in the Holy Trinity. Um, and Christianity, in a way, is divided up because they have different opinions. For example, some people believe that. Uh, God is two natures and one person through Christ. Um, and they're all connected together. So other people think it's two natures. God is two natures and he is two beings. 
you know, God and then or Jesus and then his God form. So I think that's a very, you know, closed lens way to look at it. Um, but we fi- go ahead. And especially it's closed when you find that if you want to believe in whatever you believe in, that there's multiple accounts of God talking with humans throughout time. And it's like, Correct. But when it doesn't fit your narrative, when it doesn't fit your narrative, it's like, you know, you don't want to really believe it. That's fucking hypocrisy. Yeah. If I would say. So I'm just like, so you don't believe this. But, you know. Yeah. God loved in the Christian way of thinking. God loved his creation so much that he wanted to experience. He wanted to set an example in flesh god is omnipotent god is everywhere he knows everything he's beyond he's beyond our realm of of living our reality he's beyond that but he wanted to set an example for his creation so he sent his son which shares the same god essence as he the father the son and the holy spirit to live the human experience and but die the human. and and Die in the human. Well, technically, he did not die because he yeah. resurrected and ascended and is now seated at the right hand of the, of the of the of the Father. So, but yes, he he, which is ultimately the biggest thing. He, God, Jesus, and God is one of the same. He defeated death, something that humans can't mm. do, but through Jesus formed a covenant between God and the people. It's something that is that has correlations with this Anunnaki's. They form a covenant between the advanced beings, being the Anunnaki, the gods, and the people, being the covenant that they that the gods told Utanapishtim, Ziasudra, Noah, Atrahasis. They made a covenant for the relationship that what it is. So, yeah, I think it's a very small way of of thinking, mm-hmm. and ultimately, I think it tells a deeper picture. You know, you don't have to be religious to appreciate the text, to appreciate what they tell you, to appreciate the deeper meaning between everything. And I think that's the problem with this TikTok brain culture. They don't look at the meaner, at the at the deeper meaning of stories and books and history and archaeology and science and how everything truly is connected. Yeah, or they just trying to their ego. Their ego ego's the enemy. It's yes. like, oh, I'm right. Everything I think is right, and everything you think, or or religion wise, mm-hmm. I've seen a bunch of. Oh, this is the way. This is the way. I'm like, you're eh, eh, you're 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 not getting the meaning, bro. No, you're not getting the meaning. Like, I think at this point, it's better for us to be all connected together than just be separated. Yes. So, in some ways, I think religion separates us, but it also should gather us together. You know, I could sit down with a Jew or a Muslim and and converse and conversate and hey why this why that do you don't you think this way don't you think that way and still love each other you love one another but many don't think that yes and there's that theme of does religion do more good than bad (laughs) and i think it depends i think and again, I am not religious. I, I, I currently, I don't know what the fuck I am. But <laughs> does religion do more good than bad? And it's simple. Through Christianity, it does more good. You find that Christianity is is a very neutral way of living. Um, I think, as history recalls. Um, Jews, you know, war happens through that. I mean, even they killed Jesus Christ. Um, Muslim is Muslim. Believe it or not, it's a violent religion. So it depends. Um, ultimately, I think it serves as a combination. You need a combination. Um, back then, you had religions to create laws. If you look at it through a not not a religious belief lens back then you had religion to unite people and to create laws now since we have since we're civilized much more civilized than we were back then you have i think it 
it needs to coexist. I think we need to have it, mm-hmm. but in accordance with modern civilization. And that is the balance now. Now, I, I would say that that is the balance. Yeah, and it comes to, like, how you just mentioned, like, you know, I want to clarify that, you know, Muslim is 100% a violent uh, religion, but the text, the text, uh, there's text that proves it is, you know. Yeah. So we're not saying that because of terrorists or whatever, you know, I, I want to clarify that we're not saying that because of terrorists. We're saying because, you know, Muslims and jihadists are two different people and, uh, you know, Muslims believe something and jihadists are just fucking yeah, and and know, then crazy shit. But go ahead. Yeah, and then there's Sharia law too. There's, mm-hmm. there's Sharia yeah. law yep. that, for for example, if uh, I speak ill of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Uh, first of all, I would never speak ill of any religion. I respect all religions and all ways of thinking. Um, but if I was to speak ill of that in a Muslim nation, I am to be put to death. Yeah, exactly. So. Or- or if I was Muslim and I don't want to be Muslim anymore, um, yeah, you would be put to put death to as death. well, in a in a in a Muslim nation. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things like that. But again, I think Muslim, I, I think all that works with modern society, and particularly uh, Western Western well, law. Well, and I know it's going to shit currently, but it works because we have a beautiful system. And when you incorporate that in, in again, Western society, um, I think it's a beautiful balance. Well, what I was trying to, I forgot what I was going to say. And, but what I was trying to say about it being violent, it, it's, it is, but it's how you, or how uh, the person uh, interprets, interprets it's the, the text. Because mm. you can know that it's violent, but you can also how you were saying you were civilized and be like, okay, bro, like I'm not just going to kill this person or do this and that. And so, so, cause there is, you know, I love their devotion. I, that's one thing that I fucking love about the, oh, yeah. the Muslims. I respect them and I love their devotion. And, and obviously when going to Muslim countries, there's, it's, it's, it's safe. Yeah. It's which, everything. Which it's, you've been, I've been, I've been to Muslim countries. I had not felt any safer and because they fear God. They mm. pray many times throughout the day, God, because they know there's consequences. You know, that's the reason why that devotion is very important. Um, and, and you know, you, you got to respect that and you got to put that in. You just, you, you just can't deny that. But, um, but those are the devoted people that, you know, what, just cause I'm a, you know, I'm, I guess I'll consider myself a Christian uh, and I go there, like, they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna just kill me, you know, unless it's some fucking terrorist fuck, but, yeah. but you give me like, like once you interpret, interpret the, the text, there's, it's, 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 it's violent, but that doesn't mean you have to be violent and, you know, yes, you get me. Yeah, um yeah, and it all serves back to uh the interpretation of it and then again the the covenant between these ancient texts. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, once you once you realize that, you know, like for example that global flood in with Utnapishtim, like that is something that unites everybody. Everybody went through that shit and and Noah only Noah and his family went through it. And then if apparently they populated the earth, uh, but in the Sumerian text, there were more people involved mm-hmm. than just a family. Um, if I'm not mistaken, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, actually with Utanapishtim, uh, no, maybe it was uh, Atrahasis, um, they engineers, uh, basically the good people, the people that had something to provide were the ones that survived. Mm-hmm. The architects, the uh, people that farm. That makes more sense. Yeah. Makes more sense. Than- we're, yeah, we're the only ones that survived, which, yeah, well, yeah, it, it serves the same message as as the Noah's. You know, it serves the same message that, you know, the people that don't cooperate were the ones that were involved in these sinister activities that ultimately led to their destruction. I mean, 
Same thing with civilization right now. You're not doing nothing good for society. It leads to destruction. It leads to 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 that mentally, um, you know, the, that's just what it is. You know, if I had nothing else to do, what well, I would go crazy. I yeah. won't, you know, you want to identify yourself in something and it doesn't over, it might lead for you to feel good, but overall it won't lead to anywhere. It, like, you know, like it, just a, it comes back when you don't have meaning for yourself. Um, the I think there's a quote that says, um, uh, an idle mind is the devil's playground when you don't have nothing to, you know, when you don't have a purpose, it's, it's grounds for the devil to do his, to do his work. Mm -hmm. But that's all I got for today, boss. Yeah. And I'll leave, uh, I'll leave this with a message that, you know, it's weird that different people, different cultures, different religions have different gods, but there's only one Satan. It's always the same Satan. Think about it. Mm. All right, guys, that is a wrap for episode 15, the Epic of Gilgamesh. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Leave your guys's remarks if you guys want us to cover a topic in the comments below other than that that's it intellects out thank you guys it's, it's a lot of uh complicity in these texts and we'll keep covering it so let's go